When fans booed England players taking the knee last weekend, a new front was opened in Britain's interminable culture wars. But while culture wars often involve tabloids and Tory ministers taking aim at anonymous students, this time the right have picked a stronger opponent and they might come to regret it. England manager Gareth Southgate on Tuesday released a really brilliant statement defending the right of his players to protest, the right of, of his players to take symbolic action such as taking the knee at the beginning of matches. Our players are role models and beyond the confines of the pitch, we must recognise the impact they can have on society. We must give them the confidence to stand up for their teammates and the things that matter to them as people. I have never believed that we should just stick to football. I know my voice carries weight, not because of who I am, but because of the position that I hold. At home, I'm below the kids and the dogs in the pecking order, but publicly, I am the England men's football team manager. I have a responsibility to the wider community to use my voice, and so do the players. It's their duty to continue to interact with the public on matters such as equality, inclusivity and racial injustice while using the power of their voices to help put debates on the table, raise awareness and educate. And that statement, I mean, we've talked about Gareth Southgate earlier this 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 week as well. His defense of his players is really, really spot on. It's exactly right. And this claim that they have the right to speak out about their political opinions and social issues, I think is really, really important because there will be lots of people saying, I'll just get on with the football, right? Why should they have a loud voice in politics and social issues? They should just get on with the football and, and let other people do politics. Now, the problem with that argument is that well yeah you know, footballers they're very very wealthy you know they, they're going to be in probably the richest um you know one percent well they're definitely going to be in the richest probably 0.1 percent of people in this country at the moment but what's important about footballers is that they are one of the few industries which is dominated by people from working class backgrounds and where there is really strong representation from people from ethnic minorities right and and so that is why i think they have been coming out with much more progressive positions than people in other industries. You should only believe someone when they say footballers shouldn't have a voice. If they also say Tim Martin, owner of, of Weatherspoon, shouldn't have a voice. Or if they say Piers Morgan, he's just a, a private school educated TV star. Why should he have political opinions? If people only think that people in these industries which are dominated by posh white men should have opinions, then you should be somewhat suspicious of the ends they are trying to pursue. And that's why Gareth Southgate's defense of, of footballers speaking out on the issues they care about, I think is super, super important. Now, another big part of this piece and what I think was probably equally important was Gareth Southgate talking about patriotism. You know, this is key because he is the manager of the England team. So he, he, he has actually a big, a big role in shaping what patriotism means. So he says, for me, personally, my sense of identity and values is closely tied to my family and particularly my granddad. He was a fierce patriot and a proud military man who served during World War II. The idea of representing queen and country has always been important to me. We do pageantry so well in Britain and growing up, things like the Queen's Silver Jubilee and royal weddings had an impact on me. Because of my granddad, I've always had an affinity for the military and service in the name of your country. Though the consequence of my failure in representing England will never be as high as his. My granddad's values are installed, instilled in me from a young age and I couldn't help but think of him when I lined up to sing the national anthem before my first international caps. Now here he's basically saying, look, uh, my vision of England, what pride means to me, is one that is quite traditional. It's, it's one that is in line with many of the older generations of, of this country. It's one which is you know, quite likely to be endorsed by the Daily Mail, for example. He's saying, look, this is my patriotism. It's not particularly subversive. But what he does say, which is incredibly important, is that this doesn't have to be everyone's vision of patriotism. And this vision of the country should never be rammed down anyone's throats, right? So on that, he says, for many of that younger generation, your notion of Englishness is quite different from my own. I understand that too. I understand that on this island, we have a desire to protect our values and traditions as we should, but that shouldn't come at the expense of introspection and progress. So he's saying, look, all you people that say, you know, taking the knee at the beginning of a football match, that's anti-English, you're disrespecting our traditions. That's ridiculous. I, I share a lot of the traditions you're talking about. In the voice of Gareth Southgate, I share lots of the idea of, of ideas of the nation that you have, but I also understand we have to be incredibly accepting of other notions of, of, of what the nation should stand for. Very, very persuasive argument. 
And finally, from from the essay, I, I want to show you, and what I think is probably most what most notable, what really stands out, is how Southgate is is willing to take a stand and face down bigoted fans who harass his players. So he says there, why would you tag someone in on a conversation that is abusive? Why would you choose to insult somebody for something as ridiculous as the color of their skin? Why? Unfortunately for those people that engage in that kind of behavior, I have some bad news. You're on the losing side. It's clear to me that we are heading for a much more tolerant and understanding society. And I know our lads will be a big part of that. It might not feel like it at times, but it's true. The awareness around inequality and the discussions on race have gone to a different level in the last 12 months alone. I am confident that young kids of today will grow up baffled by old attitudes and ways of thinking. We are, I think, really, really lucky to have someone as as thoughtful of this who is manager of, of England, because I think it must mean a lot to those players that they have a football manager who is expressing this you know, very, very thoughtful defence of them taking a knee at the start of matches and who actually seems quite committed actually to England being a force for the generation of a new progressive identity in Britain. Well, England, I suppose, as he's manager of England. Yeah, and I mean, the comparison is in the US, the treatment of players like Colin Kaepernick for, you know, doing a similar gesture um, before before their games, you know, how how they have been treated by owners of the, N- the NFL. Um, I really commend him for, you know, showing up for his players and not being cowed um, by by reactionary dogma. You know, he's that was a risk, you know. Um, it's not necessarily what his base might want to hear. And he's showing courage where many of our politicians um, and journalists are really failing in this discussion. And, you know, I think someone really needs to write something on why football is becoming at this particular moment. I know it historically has been at many times, but at this particular moment, it's becoming this kind of key, key space of like, oppositional political sense making, you know, from like the Super League to Marcus Rashford to the dynamics that are playing out here. I think it's that's very interesting. I'm definitely not the one to write it, but someone should. Um, <laughs> but I want to bring it, I want to bring it back to that conversation again, that language of how sno- the, the language of snowflakes is just such projection. You know, they call us snowflakes for like wanting to talk about racism or wanting to change the root causes of racism. Yet they're losing their minds because footballers are taking a knee. Like, like it's hardly a radical example of like anti-racist direct action. It's literally just a gesture of like stop racism in the most like vague and unthreatening terms. Um, but also, you know, that there, there is this whole dynamic, and I think that, and I think it's why that kind of compromise that has historically, you know, over the past, you know decade or two has sort of assuaged a lot of anti-racist mobilization. It's that compromise of representation as a replacement for radical change. And I think it's breaking apart, you know, it's it's losing cachet with the younger generations. And that's because of this dynamic that many of us have now seen that when you accept representation um, as a replacement for, you know, structural change, what you're actually giving into is this idea of like of shut up and play you know you're in the inner circle whether it's a football team whether it's you know in an organization in an institution in a political party you know you're in just shut up and play um we don't want to hear what you have to say especially when it challenges us or it involves transforming or changing things in any way and it's the same in these elite universities these elite universities will happily use you know, students of colour to pat themselves on the back for diversity, but then they'll punish those same students for actually bringing anti-racist perspectives into the university. And it's a sense of, you know, you can be here, but don't even think about trying to change anything. If you try, we're going to say that you're being inappropriately political, even though this whole damn thing is political. And especially booing players for taking a knee is itself a political act. It's a deeply political act. So I think that, you know, Gareth Southgate saying, you know, whatever my own values are, this idea of saying, particularly to players of colour, shut up and play, is is wrong. We have to make space for voices, especially marginalised voices. And it's very welcome solidarity from Gareth Southgate. And I think that's the power in it. The booing that we're seeing, it carries this sense of like, we don't really want you here. But if you're going to be here, then you have to be here on our terms and you have to be grateful for it. And Sometimes I think that, you know, and first of all, I think that's kind of representative of how a lot of people of colour in Britain feel, um, the country is generally saying to them. 
Um, but, you know, sometimes I think that people actually need a big dose of what they think they want. You know, what if all those players of color went on strike? You know, withdraw their labor, have have your all white team who, you know, don't who whatever, who don't bring up these challenging things for you. And let's see how that goes. You know, I often say that like without rec without recognition of the empire, the very English cup of tea is just a cup of milk and hot water. And, you know, who wants to drink that? You could imagine a different manager would have allowed a division to be generated within the England football team between players of colour and, and white players. And then you have a situation where, you know, at the extreme, like you're saying, you do have players of colour who are saying, like, we're, we're not going to be part of this. And what, what Gareth Southgate has done very effectively is, is say, look, we are all one team. We are acting as one people. Yes, the taking the knee probably means something more to the players of colour, but every everyone in the whole squad has agreed we will be taking the knee at the start of matches. If you've got a problem, take it up with all of us as a whole. And I think, you know, that that's what's so what's so powerful about what he's done there. And it does make me, you know, even more positive. I, I I'm not a massive football fan, but I do watch the the international ones. And it does, I think it it, it bodes well for Euro 2020, which is taking place in 2021.